I'm the chief scientist, which means I'm not the director or the deputy director, and they don't nor normally let me out to give overview talks like this. But uh, the way things worked out, I got to be here, and it's great to see a few people that I haven't seen for two years what with the pandemic. Um, so this will have a tiny bit more science in it, I think, than, than typical overviews. Uh, and I, I, I hope to stimulate maybe some discussion about where the field is going. And also, uh, maybe what, what QSC is doing that is different from what the other centers are doing. There's certainly a lot in common between the centers that you're hearing about, because they were all funded by the same agency at the same time. Um, but there are some things that only QSC is doing, and uh, why we're doing those might be worth explaining a bit. So, very briefly, um, I'm, I'm going to give the standard overview for a few slides. Uh, our overarching goal is to try to identify a few problems where it might be hard, say, for industry to solve these problems on its own. Um, but there is some expertise in DOE, uh, aside from just the expertise of running very large projects over the years, uh, that might be relevant. So particular roadblocks that are relevant to quantum technologies, uh, a large one is materials. And there's a lot of expertise in sort of non-traditional materials in DOE, in Oak Ridge and other national laboratories. Um, there's also something I'm going to spend a bit more time on today, a lot of computational expertise. And as an example, if you've ever diagonalized a matrix on a large, highly parallel computer, you might well have used LAPAC or something like that, which is software that was developed at the DOE labs, uh, largely at Oak Ridge and LBL. And they developed it not because maybe they had interests in every matrix you might diagonalize, but there were a lot of scientific problems that led to the development of modern numerical software. And that turns out to be useful for all kinds of non-scientific problems as well. So the hope is that in partnership with industry, uh, and industry at all scales, I'll talk about our specific partners in a second, but that again, the national labs have a role to play in, uh, in making quantum software, which is probably the biggest revolution since parallelization. And who knows, maybe even bigger. And then finally, um, the one I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on, although I will mention it very briefly, just in case there are people who, who would like to ask more about it, uh, DOE has certain science goals, for example, in high energy physics or in condensed matter physics that depend on, on uniquely good sensors um, in various energy ranges. And building those is an important enabling part of quantum technologies. Uh, Fermilab is one of our partners. You already heard about Fermilab earlier. Um, and for the same reason that we would like to build better sensors to go after certain kinds of dark matter, for example. So that is a fun science topic that I, I don't think I will say much about today. Um, here's the, a small part of the team, actually. We have a, a large and, and pretty nationally spread group of people. I have a map in a second, but the main point I would make is that in addition to sort of usual suspect university partners and four national labs, Oak Ridge, Los Alamos, Fermilab, and uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab, which is one of the major software enterprises in DOE. Um, we do have corporate partners ranging from startups up to places like Microsoft and IBM. Um, and I, I think this variety of partnerships is especially important for some of the computation challenges. And uh, the two people I put in a box here are, are the director, outgoing director, and uh, deputy director, and new interim director. Um, so I'll introduce them in a second. Um, they may be people to follow up on some of the more administrative questions you might have. Um, but first, you know, the way we try to keep all of this together is in addition to our partners, the people who are actually participating in research, we have two councils um, that are doing a very good job of keeping us abreast of what's going on in the field, uh, whether in the scientific part of the field or the industry part of the field. And maybe for this audience, the IAC is very relevant. Um, and you can see this is a mix of sort of pure play quantum people like Rigetti with people who are ultimately hoping to be users maybe of quantum technologies developed elsewhere. Uh, the chair is Bo Beagle from AMD. Um, and then, of course, we, we talk a lot with our friends in the other national quantum centers um, and other quantum things going on, even if they're not through the Department of Energy. So that's who we are. Um, and in particular, I mentioned, uh, well, we have some turnover, but it's a good thing. Our founding director, David Dean, who's a nuclear physicist by training, was actually appointed uh, the deputy director for science of the, the largest DOE nuclear facility, Jefferson Lab. Uh, and our deputy director is going to be stepping in as interim director, Travis Humble, who is a, a quantum chemist with a great deal of interest in quantum information over the years. Um, and he, until this point, before becoming acting or interim director, um, he's actually been in charge of our industrial relationships. So he is someone that, that you might have on your radar. I think I have his email later. Um, 
for more detailed ways that we could help you or, or you could help us or something mutual. So we are very focused on, while we're doing our own research, um, trying to translate that to eventually impacting industry, what people use out there. Um, so we do have some research that I would characterize as very fundamental. Um, but we are doing more device and prototype research than in a typical uh, federal government program, I would say. Um, and we are trying to stay very much in touch with industry on both the hardware and the software side, um, because we don't just want to be you know, doing our own things that only the Department of Energy cares about. Uh, certainly, many of our science drivers are problems that the Department of Energy cares about, but we hope that in solving some of those, uh, we will do things that everyone cares about. Um, so that's kind of our vision. And, and then I'll get to uh, the examples of how we're unique. So there are a lot of, uh, these are sort of major national facilities that are involved. There's one I'm going to focus on because you might not have thought of it as being useful for a quantum computer. Um, I think it's actually very useful for the first science problems that are going to be solved on quantum computers, uh, which is this one down here. So I'll come to that in a second. But maybe the general picture is, you know, we do have four national labs. And there are unique things in the national labs, in particular, many of the technical challenges that are just not possible in a university, and I can say that because I'm primarily a university professor, um, are possible in a national lab. You know, large-scale software development, large-scale technique development, things that take a large group of people a large amount of time, say, beyond a graduate student's thesis. Um, you can sometimes do those in companies if you have the right attitudes, maybe. I used to work at Bell Labs. Um, but it's easier, maybe, sometimes to do them in a national lab. So now I want to get to uh, some things you might not have thought about too much before. Uh, so I want to say a little bit about algorithms and computation um, and how what we're doing maybe couples at a high level to, to what other places are doing in algorithms, and then how we're using the quantum computers we have now. So at the same time as we're trying to advance making quantum computers, uh, including a strategy that maybe you've heard about, but uh, only vaguely, that I'll tell you a bit more about, um, we're also very interested in the quantum computers we have now, the so-called NISC machines. Um, and while we're running on those machines, you know, we're interested in our science problems, but we're also very interested in just advancing the development of numerical software, compilers, things like that more generally. And then the second, uh, so we are both using materials to build better quantum computers, but I want to explain why uh, a particular kind of experiment on materials is turning out to be a great benchmark for near-term quantum computing and quantum algorithms, um, which is not something that was so much on the radar five or 10 years ago. Um, the basic challenge is that some quantum algorithms or problems, let's say, seem a little bit more robust to noise than others, which is great. Um, but what's hard to find is a problem that is robust to noise, uh, is rapidly checkable, and uh, is useful. So you can often find problems that fit in two of the three categories, but maybe not in all three. So I'll, I'll talk about a strategy to try to get to all three. And then as I mentioned, uh, while we do have some very impressive high energy physics detectors being built and things like that, uh, I'd be happy to talk about it more, but it's the, the part I'm going to cut in the interest of time today. And then once I've talked about a bit how we're unique, which is partly what we're going to do, but also a few results that we already have, um, I would close with a couple slides about our interactions with industry. Uh, and I hope that maybe we can see some new interactions today. So the way that our, our picture of how quantum algorithms work uh, we would like to be the link between the applications, and I'll talk about one or two of them, in the DOE landscape, where the DOE is very interested in solving particular problems as quantum hardware emerges. Um, but we also want to couple to the, the larger world of quantum software. So we're, we're partners with both Microsoft and IBM, in addition to startups uh, of different scales. And there, uh, we would like to you know, have our creation of numerical software be some of the first practical tests of quantum programming languages, quantum algorithms, things like that. And um, so there, there's a, a broad variety of work. This thrust is led by Andrew Sornborger out of Los Alamos, who's been working in this area for quite a long time. Um, but one high level point I might make is, you know, as we are creating algorithms and trying them out on near term quantum hardware, um, we're actually benchmarking them against studies in our materials thrust. Um, and ultimately, uh, we would like to broaden the definition of what's an algorithm, maybe, to make a little bit more progress in sensing and things like that. So what is the most efficient way to use some number of noisy sensing qubits, for example? Um, and the big goal, which I think you will have heard about probably uh, in some of the other center talks, is 
I, I guess what I want to stress is in this thrust, we're not waiting for the magic fault-tolerant quantum computer. We're happy to see what we can do with what we have now. And the answer is already, uh, as you can see out there in the broader world, some interesting things. Um, we are very interested in this quantum software development, uh, imitating what the DOE did in the past. And then, you know, the, a, a big thing out there, I think, for pretty much all of these DOE centers is, uh, let's say, probably, that quantum advantage has been demonstrated in a sense that might satisfy a theoretical computer scientist. Or if not, it will be soon. Um, but it's probably on problems that are not, you know, there's not a big market for them in industry. There's not a big market for them in the government. Um, can we bring more science problems to quantum advantage uh, in the fairly near term? And there, um, this is one way of, let me just go and bring up the second part. So within just focusing on physics for the moment, uh, there are a lot of problems in physics where we believe, even if we can't prove it rigorously, but after 50 years of trying, we believe, for example, that most materials where the electrons interact strongly with each other and sort of invalidate a one electron picture are hard. No one is going to come up with an algorithm on a classical computer that will solve you know, predicting the temperature of high temperature superconductors easily. Um, there, are, there are a lot of things we can do. And we, I will show maybe some work that was successful because of classical algorithms for quantum correlations. Um, but we do have an understanding, I guess, both for physics problems and for computer science problems. Uh, at least one thing that we've learned so far is which things are, are likely to remain hard on quantum computers, which things are likely to be doable on classical computers or already are doable. And then, of course, the interesting range in between. Um, so for science problems, I guess what I might say about DOE interests for people who don't normally think about that particular agency, um, DOE funds a very large fraction of the materials in chemistry research in the US, uh, the basic materials in chemistry research. And there, um, there are a lot of problems that would actually make a difference. Uh, things like catalysis, you know, for example, for the green economy. Um, things like finding new drugs even, or new reaction pathways in chemistry. Um, our main focus tends to be more toward the materials and extended systems. So for example, if I give you silicon, it's got an enormous number of atoms, but we can study it pretty well with a classical computer. If I give you a high temperature superconductor, it's not harder because it's got more electrons. It's harder because they interact in a much more complicated way. So in other words, the, the definitions of difficulty are not necessarily the ones you hear about in, in quantum chemistry or in computer science, but we do have a notion of what's difficult. And we're starting to see where quantum computers are going to make a difference. Uh, so I guess what, what, what I'd put in the box is, um, for the near term, there's still going to be a lot of classical pre-processing before you turn on the quantum computer. You want to save your quantum resources for the very hardest part of the problem. But we do understand, at least in the specific disciplines where we're working, um, how to do that and, and where the quantum hardware as it comes online is going to make a difference. And as an explicit example, here's one of our science highlights from the first year. Um, and I mention this because it, it used an approach that is very uniquely QSC. And I'll show you the machine on the next slide. Um, but this is a proof of principle using classical computation and then a, a quantum materials experiment. The basic idea of this paper, and I, I won't get into the physics details, but there are certain materials where the electron charge doesn't move around. You've got localized electron spins. If you want, you can think of it as a giant array of many, many billions of qubits, if you like, of spin halves. Uh, but they interact in a pretty constrained way because you don't get to totally pick everything about the solid. Um, but there was a theoretical prediction that if you had materials where spins formed one-dimensional chains, you would get a new kind of fluid dynamics. It's actually one of the things that Parisi just won the Nobel Prize in physics for, is what's called Cardar parisi zhang dynamics. It's basically a way that things can move around that is intermediate between moving freely or ballistically and moving diffusively. Um, so this super diffusive behavior was actually uh, predicted as a consequence of quantum mechanics in these spin chains seen numerically, which is only possible because it's a quasi one dimensional problem. We can use the matrix product states or DMRG algorithm. And then it was seen experimentally. And that experimental part, even though it's not what I did, is what I want to kind of focus on here. Because I think it shows one kind of verifiability um, where DOE has a lot to contribute and QSC has a lot to contribute. And the basic idea of that, uh, so there's the Parisi picture. Um, to say what we're doing and why in this particular area. So I'm going to tell you about building new quantum computers in a second. But this you could think of as a test problem that is verifiable and useful for current quantum computers. It's just to figure out these spin problems. So find the ground state, for example, of this 
a uh, so-called Heisenberg antiferromagnet, which in qubit language is just a bunch of nearest neighbor interacting qubits on a pretty simple lattice. Let's take the Kagame lattice, which if you find the right rock, it will actually have spins made up in this pattern. Um, and that's a problem that we can't solve. People in my field work for many years on trying to find this kind of ground state or dynamics, and we can't solve it, but we can measure it. Um, so the advantage of chemistry and materials problems uh, is that they seem to be a little bit more robust to noise than computer science problems like factoring. That's one reason why at places like IBM and Google, if you look at the papers coming out, there's an increasing number that are motivated by problems in chemistry or materials physics. But there's a disadvantage, which is that if you give me the factors of a giant number, it's pretty easy for me to tell if you're, if you're telling me the truth or not. I just multiply them, which is a fast operation. Um, so we can't do that, theoretically, for problems like find the dynamics of spins on this lattice. But we can do it experimentally. So uh, if you happen to have a billion dollars, you could buy a machine like this. But most people don't. So there's only one of them right now, which is the Spallation Neutron Source at Oak Ridge. And it's a way to get an enormous amount of data on the dynamics of qubits you know, dynamics of many billions of qubits, if you want, on this lattice. Um, now, it's not controllable in the way that a, a true quantum computer is controllable, but it is a very good check um, because it's got four-dimensional data, if you want. It's got dependencies on time and space of spin dynamics. Uh, so we're using, if you like, neutron scattering as a way to check certain special cases. And if you can make a quantum algorithm, you know, in the near term that can solve problems like this and agree on the special cases that we can check, then we're very likely to believe that you've really solved the problem. And, and people in the quantum matter field will be quite happy with you, I can say. Um, so coming back now to another way that I think we're unique. Um, so we've got three different kinds of qubits that are maybe the focus of what's going on in QSC. I think the two that you've already probably been exposed to at this meeting, if not before, are superconducting qubits and trapped ions. Um, the one that you might not have heard before is what's called a topological qubit. And the major industrial driver of that has been Microsoft. And that is a, a very hard kind of qubit to make, where at the moment there is not a single topological qubit, uh, an artificial one out there. Um, I want to explain why it's worth trying, uh, why Microsoft, for example, tried, and then how we came in. So Microsoft tried for about 10 years, uh, has been trying with standard materials, if you like, off-the-shelf semiconductors and, and superconductors. Um, and that's really been two steps forward, one step back, let's say. Um, so we're going to bring some new materials to bear on that, because that's where DOE has a lot of expertise, materials that are alternative superconductors and, and semiconductors and so on. But here's why, in, in one slide, um, this is maybe the way to get out of the NISC era. So, the basic idea is that quantum computing is harder than classical computing in a number of ways, but one of them is error correction. In classical computing error correction, you just need to be right 1% more often than you're wrong. Um, in quantum computing, there's a threshold. And if you have fewer errors than the threshold, then you can correct them. Um, but correcting them takes a lot of qubits, and the threshold is, is fairly stringent. So I hope that we will be able to get with superconducting qubits and trapped ions and others out of the NISC era and to fault tolerance. Uh, but if you want, as a way of hedging your bets, there are a few phenomena in physics, um, there are at least two, that we know that are incredibly robust. Uh, one of them, the one I have on this slide, was recently used to redefine the volt because it's so robust. And that is, um, if you take a big chunk of material which can have defects, you don't have to go to extremely low temperature, you put on a magnetic field and you measure how the current gets bent by the magnetic field, if you do that in two-dimensional materials, uh, going back to 1980, you can measure a non-zero value of the conductance, which is precise to about one part in a billion. In other words, this is a macroscopic effect, um, but the fact that there are defects and jiggling and so on in the material don't spoil it. It's as robust as you could hope for. That's why it's a good definition of the volt, because you can take your chunk of material and your magnet and do this in some other continent, and you'll get the same number. Um, the other effect that might be like that is even older, the uh, AC Josephson effect, which is related, of course, to how we make superconducting qubits. So can you use that robustness you know, and, and make a quantum computer out of it. And that's the idea of topological quantum computing. And the underpinnings of that won the Nobel Prize in 98 for Bob Laughlin up at Stanford. Um, the hard part is making it all work. But the basic idea is there are, in principle, operations that you could carry out that would have a degree of topological protection related to that. Um, challenge is making it actually work in the lab. Uh, and that's been a, a goal that really kicked off in earnest, I would say, about 10 years ago. Um, and it's still not done yet. Um, but that's why we're trying, if you like, because we, I think if you want uh, to ask what are approaches that could just 
reduce by orders of magnitude um, the single qubit error in a scalable way. Um, this is an idea out there that uh, it's hard, but if you're gonna ask the government for $115 million, then probably at least something you're doing ought to be hard. And this is one of the, the hard things that we're doing in our big piece. But as an example of how, you know, there's progress along the way that is useful for other things. There's a whole materials innovation and device chain here where we have to make new materials that will be better for this. Um, a lot of that is at Oak Ridge and Los Alamos. Um, and then at places like Purdue, there's a great deal of expertise in nanofabrication and uh, nano device measurement is uh, very strong at Microsoft. So, and Caltech has a lot of theoretical ideas, for example. So we, we are trying to you know, take this very hard problem and this is just one example of our kind of science. Um, here's another. Um, our goal is to basically take some of the really hard roadblocks out there that might be tough through a different channel and, uh, and see what we can do over the time scale of the center. And we're not gonna build the topological quantum computer in five years, uh, but we hope to demonstrate the first step toward a really good topological qubit, which is what's called quasi-particle fusion. Um, that would certainly warrant another five years, at least, uh, of trying that direction. So here's another platform that is maybe more connected with the test beds that you heard about from Rick. So we have uh, interest in ion trap platforms as well, we're using the control electronics that come from Fermilab. So Fermilab builds giant particle accelerators and is extremely sophisticated in cryoelectronics. Um, so we're coupling the national labs to try to approach this. Um, another thing that Fermilab is very good at is putting things in low noise, deep undergrad environments. Um, and then finally, you know, the, the different other aspects of this are using the other national labs. And then with quantum simulation, we would similarly like to translate that ultimately to industry. Um, so this is the one thrust I didn't talk about, but I did want to mention one name, which is Aaron Cho from Fermilab, is a, a noted high energy physicist. And in the spirit of showing cool things, uh, you probably saw there was a, a Google paper, and maybe other groups have seen this as well, showing that cosmic rays are actually a significant source of noise that may be a limiting factor. Um, so one solution to that is to go deep underground. Uh, if, 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 if you can't come up with a better way, like topological qubits, you go underground. So to close, I wanted to say a bit more in detail about how we hope to engage with industry, aside from the people who are already our research partners. Um, and that's where uh, the person who has more experience in this area with things like intellectual property and, and the various possible commercial or non-commercial partner relationships is uh, Travis. Um, he's also the director of a, of a, a he's a journal editor of a journal in quantum computing, so he's pretty uh, technically savvy as well. And, um, I've worked with him a bit. He, he is, among his other hats, uh, one of the key people at Oak Ridge in their program to bring quantum computing resources from outside to users. So research partners, uh, by that I mean places that are actively pursuing our science goals with us and maybe contributing people, ideas, resources. Uh, technological transfer, we do want the discoveries that are made in QSC to make it out into the broader community. Um, and then finally, we certainly uh, use capabilities and buy capabilities and so on that are out there in the private sector. So if you have something that you think is particularly relevant to what we're trying to do, uh, please feel free to reach out to Travis. I mean, I'm happy to read emails too, but I probably won't know the answer, so I'll just forward it to Travis. So if you want to save time, you can go to him. And then uh, the other person I wanted to mention as I wrap up is um, Sasha from Purdue. And, and there... Just like the other centers, we were charged with the Department of Energy with broadening the quantum workforce. Uh, you know, Berkeley is a case where you can take classes from Umesh Vazirani on quantum computer science, for example. Um, not everyone has access to people like Umesh, so uh, we would like to make the quantum workforce a broader thing, a more diverse entity as well. Um, and there, we are trying to start up something new. So we've already been running a summer school and doing various other things. But one particular thing I wanted to mention um, we have a lot of postdocs and students involved. That's, if you track where the money goes, a pretty significant fraction of our overall expenditure is to support junior people. And we would like those junior people to get a slightly broader picture than maybe the standard university educated person would about the quantum uh, enterprise here in the US. So is it feasible, um, and you know, there's a famous example of this actually at, at Bell Labs back in the old days, to have some kind of postdoc exchange program where maybe people who are primarily employed by QSC, you know, we already have people who are interacting with our set of partners, but I think we would be willing to consider if you feel you have the right project and you want to talk to one of our postdocs, um, 
we might be able to find some kind of postdoc exchange program. That's at least one thing we're trying to discuss actively. So in other words, we're already running things like a quantum summer school that was extremely well attended because it was online. Um, I don't know if we could possibly get so many people in person. Um, but, but one conversation we're having with our industrial advisory council, um, we are very serious about you know, how can we take the people that we're training and, and have them have rewarding careers, whether it's in universities or national labs or industry. Um, certainly at the moment, many people from my group are moving to industry, so they seem to find it rewarding on uh, different levels. Um, so we'd like to have that happen for QSC too. And then Sasha, just to give a, a bit of background, she's very involved with the national efforts like QEDC and so on in workforce development. So um, thank you for, for letting me tell you a bit about our team and, uh, and what we're trying to do. And I'm happy to discuss any questions you have. Thorough overview, uh, a lot going on. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Celia. Any questions uh, about the QSC and all of their doings? First of all, that's a really great talk, very inspiring. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you showed the chart of NP Hard and P Space and BQP and all of this. Have you, is there another chart which is all DOE problems mapped to this <laughs> to find out and, and also to break down the BQP into the NISC BQP and fault tolerant BQP so some of the problems can be solved in the near term? Yeah, the problem is it's a great deal of empirical knowledge that is hard to formalize even in like a research paper, much less a table. So for example, you know, something I work on a lot is you could call it quantum matter with fermions, whether it's electrons or quarks or whatever. And there, um, we know, for example, that some problems uh, don't have a, a so-called sign problem. So fermions, you move them around, you get minus signs. That makes many calculations hard. But if you can cancel out the minus signs, you can do quantum Monte Carlo. Um, and quantum Monte Carlo is extremely powerful if you don't have to worry about the minus signs. So uh, uh, an example of your question would be, could, do we have a good answer to which, which physics problems have a sign problem and which don't? And the answer is we have a lot of experience, but no, I mean, we have a few proofs, but the, the problems we really care about, like for example, we all believe that if you take the high temperature superconductors before you dope them, before you put the electrons in, it doesn't have a sign problem and we can solve it very well. When you, when you put the electrons in that make it go superconducting, we believe it's extremely hard because we've been trying for so long, but there's no proof. Um, there, are, there are limited forms of a proof, but I guess I, my, my sense with most of the DOE science challenges and something good that happened as a result of government funding was to get the theoretical computer scientists talking to the theoretical chemists and physicists and so on. It's a bit more like machine learning or something if you want a computer science analogy where we have a lot of things that work um, we don't always, we can't always prove that they work. So for example, uh, there are problems we can solve, but where a theoretical computer scientist might say, well, you got the right answer, but that doesn't mean you solved it. You know, you might, you might just have gotten lucky. Maybe you didn't solve the problem in general. So um, I guess that with, with science problems, we could make a picture, um, but it would be hard to justify in very rigorous terms. So I would say that the hardest, okay, so many body problems, uh, that require fermions, except in certain special cases. Uh, the special cases are basically one dimension or being able to transform away the signs because of some kind of symmetry. Uh, many body problems with fermions above one dimension are hard. And that applies to you know, quantum chemistry, uh, quantum materials, nuclear physics, et cetera. Um, now, what's happened is you know, even though, for example, silicon or some simple organic molecule, those are hard in principle, um, but we've developed rules of thumb that work really well. Um, so like you, you can read about silicon and, and gallium arsenide and things like that, and um, there are algorithms or, or pictures that work well for those, but we know that they would break down if I just change the elements a little bit or something like that. So in other words, I guess uh, the problem with drawing a picture like this for physics problems, which I agree would be great, uh, we sort of, we, we, have, we know what's going on, but it's, uh, it's still more empirical than proof-based. So there are the computer sciences ahead of us. Yeah, that, that's right. And this is why this is a nice thing about quantum computers, where uh, dynamics are harder than statics with most classical algorithms, but the opposite tends to be true on quantum hardware. 
Yeah, and then, uh, but and it's worth saying that you know even classically there are things that are provably hard that appear in physics. So if I gave you like a random uh, spin Hamiltonian, somewhat like the kind of problem that the D-wave machine is going after, uh, that can actually be a classically hard problem. Just find the classical ground state of some you know highly constrained many variable optimization problem. Uh, that's NP hard just as a classical computer science problem. So physics will continue to throw up hard problems, but the, the good news I guess is it seems like uh, Many of the problems that have bedeviled us for decades um, are at least starting to be accessible. You know, not right now, but I, I think before I retire, I hope to see a lot of progress on some of these problems that were around already when I was a grad student. One more question back here. Is there a mic? You mentioned the topological quantum computers. Uh, actually, early this year, uh, Microsoft de declared uh, they didn't observe the uh, Majorana uh, fermion. So I'm curious, uh, what's your opinion about that? Does that mean it is very, still very far away to have a practical topological quantum computer? Thank you. Um, I think it's reasonably far away. And I, that's what I was thinking of when I said two steps forward, one step back. So that, that's a reason why, I mean, in a way, it's good for QSC because our idea was let's try some new materials that haven't been tried by Microsoft. You know, Microsoft, if we want to, was uh, asking since 2010, can we take superconductors and semiconductors that are off the shelf that we understand well and build something and, and look for Majoranas? Um, and the answer is they see zero bias peaks. So if you want a technical answer, um, they see signatures that could be from Majoranas. But what was taken as a smoking gun, they almost had to be Majoranas, which was a quantized conductance tunneling into them. That is the experiment that's been retracted uh, from Delft. Um, so what that suggests is that if you want to keep trying for Majoranas, maybe you should try something different. Um, so what we are trying um, is to use materials that have a lot of advantages. Um, they're harder to work with, but there is expertise in working with these. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, yeah, so that picture on the left, um, we are trying to work with, OK, the basic Microsoft strategy was to take non-topological semiconductors like indium arsenide and put them into a topological state with a magnetic field. Um, what we're doing is starting with materials that are already topological, which is so-called topological insulators and possibly topological superconductors. So if you want an example of a Majoran experiment that is still out there, and I, I have every reason to believe is true, there's an experiment between Beijing and Japan looking for Majorana modes and vortex cores of a possibly topological superconductor. Um, so there is you know, evidence that there are Majoranas out there in various systems. The problem is that the really clear experiments that would differentiate a Majorana, which is the key particle for topological quantum computing, sorry for going through everything so quickly, um, the key experiments that would let you make sure that that's what you have, um, have not been seen. But the thing that was very suggestive that was seen in that Beijing slash Japan experiment was um, if you bring two of these objects together, their energy moves away from zero energy uh, more or less in the predicted way. Um, so I think there's still evidence out there for Majoranas, but you're right that uh, the, the, the hope that we could get there very quickly with non-topological materials, um, that hope took a, a big step back in the last year or two. Thank you for a lot of information in your answer. Well, uh, I'm going to wrap up the session. If you have more questions for Joel, please come up and, and let's thank him again. Thank you. Thank you.